Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome to Christ Church Cathedral, day number one of the spring edition of the Ottawa International Writers Festival. My name is Sean. I'm the festival's artistic director. I want to thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, our two openers are able to be here to set the stage for 2018 as we put uh, 150 behind us, as we put 2017 to bed and move towards something I, I think that's going to be a lot more interesting um, and a lot more exciting. Uh, Lee Maracle was going to be here uh, last fall, just like uh, John Ralston Saul, and uh, also was struck down and uh, couldn't make it at the last minute. Um, and in a way, not I wasn't glad that she's sick, but I'm glad um, because you know, we, we covered so much ground last year at, at the festival, and it is lovely to be starting 2018 off with, again, this, this real examination of who we are, where we are, and a little bit of truth to power. A little bit of truth to power. Um, Lee's an amazing writer, a poet, a fiction writer. Celia's Song is available out there. Uh, that's one of the most remarkable novels I've ever read. Uh, and a novel that was turned down by one Canadian publisher, she told me, for being too foreign. <laughs> Which is very funny and terrifying at the same time, that you would have a Canadian press suggest that the wisdom of our first people is foreign. Um, it's pretty bizarre. Anyway, um, She's here to share some of her conversations with Canadians. As always, Jim from Perfect Books is happy to sell you uh, copies. Uh, he'll make a donation to children's literacy for each one you buy. The authors get a cut, publishers get a cut, uh, even the mayor gets a cut because this is a tax-paying uh, bricks-and-mortar bookstore out there, if you can believe it. Uh, such a thing still exists. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, the festival continues uh, through until uh, May 1st. Um, we've got some remarkable people coming. Uh, what a great way to open the festival. Let's give a warm Ottawa welcome on unceded Algonquin territory uh, to Lee Maracle. Uh, thank you very much. It's good to be here in Ottawa. I can hardly see you, but I'm sure you all look lovely. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. <laughs> and I liked uh, John's talk about how Canadians are different. I believe that Canada is fit for cultural theory. That's what we're fit for. But we don't ask the questions. There's a sense of courtesy here that's stronger than even than it is in, in England about stiff upper lip and don't ask any questions. And I was in England many decades ago, it seems like, the 92, uh, when the, the 500 years, you know, that kind of thing. So they invited me. And uh, the cultural minister said that our host, who is a black Scot woman, and I remember thinking how the odd that was. Oh my God, this Scotland, and there she is with the probe. Okay, <laughs> this is like Canada. <laughs> she. Uh, he thought she was too forward, and I didn't think she was forward at all. I thought she was extremely polite, given what was going on in, in uh, England at the time. But anyhow, uh, I didn't say anything. Uh, and then I went to Scotland again as an actor. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> an improvisational actor. Who knew? <laughs> I did not know that I could do that, but there I was last summer in the, the doing shows there, and I was quite surprised. Um, the people really loved it. They loved it so much, they wanted us to make a demonstration to the Scottish Museum to get the bones of the Mi'kmaq that are in the museum back to their resting place in Canada. So I participated in that, of course. Um, anyway, she was there. And they give a big ching dig for the actors. And she sees me and she says, Lee! <laughs> I said, hi, how are you doing? It's been 26 years. <laughs> she says, get up here and recite some poetry. I did not have a poem with me because I wasn't 
expecting to be performing. But I gave the opening of a Stalo woman and how we introduce ourselves. So when I hear John Walston saw talking about we don't ask the questions and so we don't know who we are as Canadians, I feel for you because I began on the back of the ocean as a single water drop rising up to love the small, tiny, almost invisible piece of dirt. I could feel west wind coming, that torrential climate changer, that torrential season changer, that torrential wind that takes me to my grandmother's land when I die. I rode on that wind all the way to Chiam. And I dropped from the sky when I hit that mountain with its seven peaks, the biggest, widest mountain base in the world. And I landed in the Stalo River. And then I rode through Hell's Gate. I rode on the backs of those rapids, on the backs of logs, on the backs of trees that had fallen into that terrible stallow. And I came out to the ocean 80 miles wide to greet the sea and the deepest sound in the world. I am stallow. I am fit for inclusion. I am fit for embracing all those sea creatures, the terrible ones, the octopus, the jellyfish, and the giant squid that occasionally war with one another. I am Stalo. So that's how we have to introduce ourselves. <laughs> this is for John Ralston Saul. Do you speak your language? I stare. I just said, how are you? I thought English was my language. Apparently it isn't. I thought Hulkamilin was gibberish. The devil's language. That's what the nun said. Apparently not. Some white guy sets me straight. Aboriginal people are losing languages. Funny. I thought I had it just a moment ago. Maybe it's in grandma's old shoebox. Maybe it's sandwiched between papers in plastic bags hidden under mum's bed. Hey, has anybody seen my language? I think it's lost. There is nothing lost as long as there's a stalo to speak. You cannot lose your language. You can just stop speaking it. What happened to it? Thank you. What happened to us, we were severed from the people who would transmit that language. We were removed, which is the genocide that was committed against us. And Canada signed that convention, the removal of a people's children is an act of genocide. I don't call it cultural genocide. That's for the senator who's very kind. He's a Nishnabe. Not so much me. When I was two and a half, I faced the water. That inlet that's the deepest sound in the world. I don't know the white man that stuck the stick in it and measured it, but there you go. I'll take the, the compliments. Not, we don't get many. And I faced my grandfather who was sailing away. And I had a club in one hand with sharp points. And I was informed by my father that Yes, you can kill a man who tries to pick you up and you don't want to be picked up by just dropping this in his eye. I'm two and a half. Then he gives me a rope. It's a cedar rope. And he says, this represents the weir, the feast bowl, and our generosity. And you are to say, I come in the world with a war club and a rope, a weir. A feast bowl. What's your pleasure? I mean that. We are not in uh, that bad a shape, except we are. One of the things uh, that I know is that we won 
many, many court cases, and we got not a stitch back. <laughs> That's Canada for you. If you do nothing, the Indians will quietly go away. And they've been negotiating with us ever since. I don't exactly know what the chiefs get into discussions about when they see a prime minister, but I know a lot of them get excited when they think that they're going to meet one. Not me. I do not get excited. I met Trudeau. I met Harper. <laughs> that was not exciting. I tell you, it was not. <laughs> and I have met the young Trudeau, too. Um, he's more exciting because he's theater. I have exciting children. They're theater people. But other than that, I have not been excited about a prime minister. First of all, the 27 court cases over land sessions, we won them and haven't got a square inch of soil back. And then we won a big one in BC that says, the only thing Canada owns in British Columbia outright is the reservations. Why are we asking to make them bigger? That's what I ask my people. I need to do a book called My Conversations with Indigenous People Now. Because are we ever in a fool's paradise? We won the court case. And I read, uh, uns uh, not unsettling, the, the, the Reconciliation Manifesto by Art Manuel, who's passed on and broke my heart when he died. I fainted dead away. I thought, what are we going to do now? <laughs> we have nobody left. No great warriors left. My grandpa's dead. George Manuel's dead. All these great men are passed on. And then Art dies. But he left breath tracks. And this is the one that I love the most. He, he realized that we won the court case. All we have to do is do whatever we want to do. So they got to uh, Okanagan, where my brother-in-law is the chief. He's also the Grand Chief of BC. And they asked him, get us a permit to go logging. And he says, where are you going to go logging, and what kind of logging are you going to do? And so he tells them, we're going to space log. This is here is a Gordi Kayawari. He's a Japanese space logger expert. Oh, and what is space logging? And uh, Gordy says, it's what indigenous people used to do in the south where I live, to get the biggest trees in the world. That's what was there in my backyard. So we had a lot of opportunities to learn. We didn't. We didn't as Canadians, and now we're not learning as Indigenous people. We are not learning from ourselves. We are foolishly, foolishly learning from Canada who is expert at removing the Indian, as my daughter always says, from the equation. Get them out of the picture. We must have Terranalias, one way or another. They don't have thoughts. They don't have great intellectuals. I know you say we're Canadian, but when you say we don't have great intellectuals, well, yeah, we do. Just non-native Canadians aren't part of that. We've had great intellectuals all along. When we say we don't have much of an understanding of our volunteerism, we do. Yes, we do. 90% of our people volunteer. The ones that don't are five and under or 95 and older. We let you go if you're 95 and older. But everybody else gets up. The first thing you hear when you're two years old is we don't watch people work. I did not know what that meant, but when my old pa uh, started struggling with a can of water, I dipped my little bucket in there and grabbed a little piece of it and went to where the fire was, where the women and the, the food was. I was volunteering at two years old because she couldn't carry the bucket. Then she was fine. Oh, that little bit, that little bit helped. And I knew I was a helper. Al how to be well. That's what we knew. And we still continue. Uh, somebody mentioned that Celia Song's a terrific book. By the way, this thing did not win uh, awards. It was long listed by CBC, but Canada can't give me an award. And now Katharina Vermet is in the same boat. You know what they're saying about us? There's no strong male characters whatsoever in this book. We cannot give it an award. 
crap. You read the break. There are no men in that book, period. <laughs> There's a few in this one. They're not that strong, but there is a few. <laughs> if you're missing men, well, there's always uh, Thompson Highway. Yeah? Or you can read some of Tom King's works. Yeah? It's his Inconvenient Indian. Or you can read any of Art Manuel's works. He's always talking about himself and his father. Apparently, he doesn't remember his sisters or his mother very much. And certainly, I'm not in those, though we were part of the same organizations all the way through. I'm okay with that. Because I don't mention him much either. We're like that, us, us indigenous people. The other thing I wanted to talk about, we were talking about decolonizing language, and I want to mention Art Manuel again, because some guy, that guy is lick shit smart. You know what I mean? Like you run across somebody that's so, that's pretty good. And I've been saying all along that you, you don't want to talk about decolonization, because if you understand what it is, you won't like it. 47% of BC belongs to Indians outright. 47% is shared. Shared. So we're the majority landholders in British Columbia. We won that court case, I think, seven or eight years ago. Not a stitch of land's been transferred. But it's because we aren't picking up on what that means. Yeah? Yeah. You know what I told my folks in uh, 1976? I said, this is how we're going to win the fishing rights struggle. And they said, how? We're going to go fishing. And we're going to keep fishing. No, we should sue them for the rights. And I said, if you sue them, you have to prove you own it. And you do not have a private property deed. Why don't you have a private property deed? Because we don't believe in private property. So we don't hand out deeds. Well, we can't prove we own anything in accordance with their law. And if you sue them, you will have to pay the court costs. Millions. Mill millions and millions of dollars is going into court costs. So we had a chief named Billy Adolph who said, oh, I'll throw my hat in that ring. I'll be the first to volunteer to get arrested. I think he got arrested 157 times, and every time they had to let him off, because every time we said, now you have to prove you own the river and the fish, that river came in. Couldn't do it. So we won our fishing rights. We won the right to commercially fish and sell those river fish. We didn't do it. We didn't do it because there's not enough fish. It would be ridiculous for us to do it. I think it's ridiculous for Canada to keep on overfishing the Pacific. And 25,000 other Vancouverites believe that too. Because we've garnered a lot of support amongst Canadians. Now those Canadians believe our young men when we say, we want fish for the future of not just our people, but your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren's grandchildren. When we welcomed you, we didn't say until this generation. We didn't say until you get nasty with us. We didn't say in case we're poor, we don't want to have you here. That's not what we said. That's why our young men joined No One Is Illegal. We have an immigration or migrant policy or whatever you want to call it. It's called guest laws. You're a guest until you're acculturated. And acculturation is learning the songs, dances, and ceremonies. I am actually in favor of everybody saying Ani in this part of the world and Sago in the southern part of the world, and restoring some of the great names of this, these places. Everybody refers to Toronto. You know that's a meaningless word, eh? You're all trying to figure out what language it was, what exactly it meant. It was no language, and it was Takaranto. Do you know what Canada means? Yeah, you're all a bunch of villagers. <laughs> I'm 
sorry, but we always find that funny because I'm a stalo. That's a big territory, <laughs> not the village. But anyway, we have to have a look at that name because I don't think it quite describes Canada anymore. <laughs> and it was a misunderstanding. It's like poor Coquitlam. Somebody said, what's the name of this place? And my great, great uncle thought he meant, what's his name? He said, Coquitlam. So they go, okay, Coquitlam, and the other one's called Port Coquitlam. And they named the town and the port after him, which he thought was very odd because he was still alive. <laughs> I think we need to look at what you didn't pay attention to when you came. I know the bear ducks are all dead, but what was not paid attention to was those, the spirit of those people and the way that they engaged one another and engaged the land. And I have a class I teach, it's called the Oral Perspective. And what I do is take the teachings and have everybody pass that through the history of their families. Because that's what we do. We pass this through the history of our families and we have some great teachings. And I know why we have those great teachings. You know, somebody once said to me, you know, I really don't know, but my teacher says uh, that calling indigenous people natural environmentalists is a stereotype. And I said, no, it's just stupid. <laughs> it's not a stereotype at all. In order to have a law against damaging the environment, what's the first thing you got to do? No, damage it. If you haven't damaged it, nobody's going to make a law out of it. We don't pull laws out of our ass for fun. Somebody has to do something that we see is a terrible consequence and we shouldn't be doing. Like peeing on the floor. Don't pee on the floor, George. <laughs> There's a bathroom. And that's why you toilet train your children. If they didn't pee in their diaper and on the floor, you wouldn't bother but they don't automatically come out able to walk themselves to the bathroom. So you have to make rules. Rules are for op opposing something that's damaging. So long before you came, we re wreaked hell on this poor place. Um, some people, you know, scientists uh, even think that we had a nuclear war going on here. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, doesn't doesn't surprise me a bit. I think we've been this way before. We've been through this hell before. It feels very familiar. This coming mass extinction event was called Hayaluk in my language. Hayaluk. Hayaluk. Now, some people call it a tsunami, but it was way worse than that. What happened was the glaciers melted from halfway down not going down into the Great Lakes, as the scientists used to tell me, but sideways. Because Raven threw a fireball from Takaranto to Semnyamu, where I live. And of course, that fireball melted the first, the thin part of the glacier, and that dislodged the rest of the glacier. Now we say Raven did this because we're always praying Raven will fix things. Look, we're about to you know, get knocked out again. Can you do something? So then we make up this myth so our kids will listen to it. Our kids will listen to a myth. They don't listen to something that's on the evening news. They don't give a rat's butt about what's going on in Syria and the refugees and stuff like that. But if we talk about the double-headed serpent is loose and he's swallowing the conscience of all those people in S Syria and hurting everybody, they're all, oh my God, we have to help them. They're all ready to volunteer. So you first have to mythologize it or the children won't listen. So that's what we did. We mythologized the melting of the, the ice. Once that happened, then the rest of the glacier came down and gouged out the Great Lakes, and Lake Winnipeg and 10,000 other lakes in uh, Manitoba. And it scraped off the dirt from the Canadian Shield, they call it, which is one of the oldest pieces of land in the world. Don't you love that? We have one of the oldest pieces of land in the world. <whistles> and then it dropped it here and created an condition of topsoil 
that was inviolable. And the Six Nations and the Wendats and the Neutrals and everybody grew stuff here like crazy for thousands of years because of this deep, seemingly unending topsoil. Well, then we went from Takaranto to Toronto. It's all cement. I don't even know what they did with the topsoil. But from the richest farmland in the world, we are now the poorest. Only the Holland Marsh is left. I don't know if you guys have been to Holland Marsh, but you should take a trip there. You can stick a stick down in that Holland Marsh and it keeps going and going and going and going and going. It's hummus and topsoil, hummus and topsoil. It is absolutely magnificent for growing vegetation and vegetables. It's Toronto's backyard garden. I'm so glad to live in that city because the onions you get there from are magnificent. I go to the Holland Marsh to buy my groceries. So think about that when you're thinking about Canada too. Thinking about what was here, what might have been here, and what could still be here if we can just prevent a high look. Anyway, what happened is the Pacific folded over, threw us every witch away, our men mainly. Our women crawled to the top of the mountains and ate maggots for almost a year. And to honor them, we do the ceremony of eating maggots, maggoty fish, once a year in our lifetime. <laughs> once, once in our lifetime. We have to do it once. I did it once. Don't have to do it again. But uh, I recommend it. It's, it will humble you <laughs> to eat maggoty fish. But that's what's going to happen if this happens again. So when you want to decolonize the language, you got to look at what people know before you came. And the thing that we don't have between us is belief. Because after I finished telling that story of this magnificent Rao Hailuk story, I had a dancer behind me dancing and making the sounds of the story. It was so, so cool to hear the sounds. I didn't see him dance, but he's supposed to be Toronto's number one choreographer, dancer. He's a white guy from England. He was pretty good. But anyway, um, after I ca this guy comes up, this white guy comes up and he has a science book and he says, you're right, that's exactly how it happened. It's right here in this book. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I remember. We remember. This is a 15,000 year old memory and you're just figuring it out now. Do you feel a little behind? And then some other white guy just the other day discovered we have an additional organ in our body. And I started laughing. I said, yeah, it's the organ that holds our oldest memories. The ones from the beginning of time. And he says it lives just under the skin. Just under the skin, in your fat. So girls, you have more fat. Maybe you have a larger organ. Maybe that's one of the things we have that's bigger than the boys. But anyway, I'm not going not gonna to discuss that very much. But in any case, we have this organ that's living just under the skin. And part of our tradition is to talk about how we get words to dance on the skin. That's the job that our elders have in bringing us about. It's not to tell us something. It's not to teach us something, but to facilitate the development of language from within the body. Now, here's the thing I know about that. I love jellyfish. They are evil creatures. I tell you, a bunch of jellyfish in the Pacific can take down a squid. For no reason at all, because they don't actually eat them. <laughs> That's a really beautiful part of it. And they absolutely communicate and collaborate. But the beautiful part is they don't have a single brain cell in their body. And you know, they're always measuring heads to see who has the biggest brain. And now they found out this, that orca whale has one that's bigger than everybody. So now they don't know what to do with the theory of brain size equals brain smarts. You know what I mean? I get, but it doesn't. It doesn't. What is smart is absolute collaboration and communication. That's what's smart. 
So the teaching, we don't watch people work. You get in there, people say, if you're a white person, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, well, don't watch people work. That's one thing. <laughs> and I start helping whoever I feel like helping. So it's totally up to you what you do. Nobody's going to tell you do this or that. It's up to you to volunteer. And you choose what you do based on what you like to do. How about that choice? So volunteerism, choice, interest, all of these things is part of the package called you. And you are a goose at the hem of a long flight of ancestors. You can sort of see it that way. There's you, and behind you is infinite grandmothers. That's the Stalo teaching. And so you're part of that. You're connected to that. And your interest in everything is based on that. And our people have a funny way of uh, figuring that out, you know. One day I lied to my granddad. I was four and a half or five. And I remember seeing his eyes go through all these emotions and thinking, oh, please, somebody take me away. Kill me now because he's going to get really mad. He's going to kill me anyway and praying that I died. And then all of a sudden he got this twinkle in his eye and he looked at me kind of half grinning and said, Good story. Good story. He says, now I'm going to tell you a story. And I want you to tell it back to me different but the same. So I listened with every single cell in my body. And then he told me the story. And I told it back different but the same. He never told me if I did it right. Wasn't the point. The point was to get words dancing on my skin and get me thinking about things in a different way. Anyway, after three summers of doing that with him and my great-grandma and my grandma and a whole bunch of other elders in Squamish and all over the place, uh, Snohomish, Topnish, all the way down to Oregon, Slats, Oregon, he said to me, you know what the white people call that, eh? And I said, no. And he says, well, when you learn to write, you'll learn about their stories. And they call their stories fiction. We call it myth-making, creating new legends from the old ones. They don't exactly do their fiction that way because they like that thing, freedom of expression. <laughs> We're much, our people are much harder on us. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we have to make up stories from what's there. And he says, so when you learn to write, you write them stories down that you just told me. They pay you a lot of money for them. I said, okay, Grandpa, I will. I think I was eight, maybe seven. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I wasn't very old. I said I would, and I did. Celia's song is based on the story of the double-headed serpent and what's called the split mind. And they're teaching this in psychology classes because it shows you what bipolar disorder actually looks like. I did not know that. I don't know anything about bipolar disorder, but I do know about the split mind. I do know about the double-headed serpent, and I do know that it took us a thousand years to recover from that disaster. Natural disaster creates family implosion, social implosion, national implosion, super violence between people. It's the mother and father of all kinds of pedophilia, incestuous behavior, and craziness. We know that. And it takes a long time to recover. And everything here started with the Industrial Revolution, in my mind. When they abrogated the laws of England, said it was all right to go around fucking kids and women and beating the hell out of them till they're dead or working them to death. And then they sent their remnants over here. And they took after the Beotak and killed all of them. And the men that came to Vancouver raped our little children. The antecedents of Picton came from San Francisco and became the Yale Towners and the most violent, appalling behavior is from them. My cousin was one of the women who was buried in the Picton farm. All that's left of her is her DNA. She will never get justice because there's no body. And the 
the Europeans in that town nearby ate the results. They fed those gals to the p pigs and the pigs were sold to the people around. So Canadians were very upset about that and started to help oppose the missing and murdered indigenous women. Up to that point, there was about 150 of us for 20 years demonstrating. Now it's in the thousands. Because Picton roped you all in to the same story. And you're being roped in all over the place. When they build that crazy oil uh, conflagration in northern Alberta and they start trucking that oil all over the place, you will all be roped in. Make no mistake. An oil spill doesn't stop at my backyard. It keeps on going. It keeps on going and it keeps on destroying. And I know because when I was a little girl, there were 127 vegetables on the shores of my toot, and now there's none. And we starved. And all those fish, they're going to be destroyed. And I have to tell you more about the jellyfish, you know. Despite the no-brain, they're coming up the rivers in the United States, and they're attacking humans. I'm not saying it's because of the Pacific Garbage Patch. I'm not saying that. I don't think they're that smart. But there's something driving them up those rivers to attack humans. They're blaming us for something. We might as well take responsibility and say the world has to clean up that garbage patch because all kinds of animals are turning nasty. They had the first murder in, I think, 47 years by a orca of a human. Now, they said it was the first ever, but I know, I remember these humans used to, uh, actually, they're a white man, let's say it. They used to play uh, games with the dolphins and shoot them. And our old people said, don't do that. They're friends of the orcas. And those are killer whales. That's what we call them. Now they went ahead anyway. Well, one of the dolphins got away, and he brought back a pod of uh, whales that didn't have a family. They were kind of uh, what they call transient whales. They're not as nice as the family cl clusters or, you know, the family groups. So they came and they tipped that boat over and crunched all the men that were on it and killed them all. So it's the second time those whales have gone after human beings. I don't know why they're doing that, but I suspect they know. Because they have, pound for pound, the biggest brain of any mammal. Can you believe that? I was stunned. Apparently they have a third brain back here. That's an emotional brain. We could use that. Some more evolution, I think. Let's mate with those guys. Oh my God, imagine if we had an emotional brain. <laughs> We need to think that way, though. We need to develop it. And I think that's what our cultural theory in this country, in this land, could be all about. Because Canadians believe that being nice is the good way to go, even if it's not the way it's going, even if it's not the way it went, even if the story and the reality is way different the dream is still there. I taught in America, and that is not their dream. Being right is their dream. America is right. So everybody should listen to us, do what we say. That's what Americans believe. And that's why they can stupidly elect someone like Trump. And they'll probably re-elect him. I just can't believe, but Reagan was another classic uh, Yahoo. But they're not that interested in going in the direction of what we call the good life or kindness. Bimadzi win in Algonquin. Bimadzi win. Remember that. It's the good life. And you'll either get it here on earth, people, because you worked at it and you volunteered for it, 
or you'll get it when you die because <laughs> you can't hurt anybody anymore when you're dead. There's a lot of things you can't do when you're dead. I had a dead guy come to me in a dream and he said, you know, you can't have sex when you're dead. What the? F <laughs> you can't? <laughs> no, you don't have a body. Oh, no. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> I don't want to die yet. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. There's a lot of things you can't do when you're dead, but experiencing kindness and giving out kindness and being loving, you can't do it without a body. So it's a privilege to be here for the hundred or so years, at least that I have. My doctor promised me 91. I said, no, that's my dad. I'm, I'm going to make it past that. I'm going to be a hundred. Like my ta'a. Uh, I come from long living people. And despite the health problems I've had over the last couple of years, they're just hiccups. I'm going to make it. I'll be there at the end. I'll be like Agatha Christie, still typing. <laughs> I want to read you another little bit here. It's on page 41. While you're thinking about all that. Because there's another thing I want you to know. That in the decolonization of words and language... Learning an indigenous language is, to me, the prerequisite for understanding this land. Israel, if you listen to the wind where I come from, that's what it says. Israel, I hear you. I see you. Israel, I am. I hold you up. Huh? And in this part of the world, Ani, the wind is settling down here. It's not so rugged. It will be kind to you. Not like on the West Coast, which threatens to tip your canoe one way or another. Anyway, as a thinker, an orator, and a stalo, I did what other indigenous speakers do. Uh, someone did something, and I'm responding. I blended theory and story together. That's to me, Canadian intellectualism. I was brought up in story. No one disciplined me by spanking me or scoldings. Rather, the old people watching me told me a story and I was expected to figure out my behavioral issues from that story. I recall being on the platform with my ex-husband, Raymond Bob, and someone said something not too clever and he said, remember grade one, think and do. <laughs> I chuckled to myself because I remember being taught that lesson when I was three. My caregiver asked me, why did you do this? I answered, I don't know. I no longer recall what I did, but I clearly remember being stared at. Note to self, there is no such thing as I don't know to a stallo. Just as I was raised on story, I brought my children up on story. We work with story. We begin with an old tale, and as we progress through the story, we tell it back different but the same, changing it to become a modern new story. Fiction, created as a continuum of original story. All through the days of public school, day school, residential school, our youth did not have the opportunity to play with our own story. Canadians played with their story from the beginning of kindergarten until the end of their doctoral years. No wonder we're having a hard time. We have much to protest. I'm an orator. Salish oratory is about thinking, and the story is there to remind us to key up our thoughts. Stories are keys to the national treasure known as our knowledge. And I do not want to hear anybody tell me that story is all we are. Because when I had a baby, I went to the best midwife, not the best storyteller. You understand? Let's be logical here. I love Tom King, by the way. <laughs> Our orators are trained to share this knowledge and give the keys to help the listener key up the knowledge. And when they need it, this way we don't have to memorize either the story or the knowledge. Each is the key to the other. And when we learn that way, we learn to put things in the proper file format in our brains. There's a brilliant white woman that wrote a book called we were born to learn. And she talks about how 
dendrites have to have to form to get a pathway to your knowledge. And I start chuckling to myself because all my knowledge is in one place. All each and beside each other. I even dreamed of it and drew it on a wheel on the wall of my house. All these different things that I automatically, when I'm listening, I'm not starting to argue with the guy that's talking to me the way I hear so many white guys do at university. He's already objecting to whatever it is you're saying before you finish your sentence. And you think, you can't possibly have heard this. I haven't said it. <laughs> you have to listen first. That's part of learning. Anyway, they don't get it. But I do. I'm such a good listener that when I am in the longhouse in ceremony and 25 students get up and commit to four things each, I remember each one and what they committed to. And I make my elders so proud. My CM was saying, that's how it's done. That's my girl. <laughs> that's listening. But you got to learn to listen with a commitment to the person speaking. That's why we say white people don't listen, because they don't commit to the person speaking. It doesn't mean you have to believe what that person says, because you'll go home and rethink it. But the first pass, if you say, well, the moon is made of blue cheese and I'm going to make a rocket and go up and get some. You want to take me with you? <laughs> I'd like to see that. <laughs> but then I'll think about it at home and I'll think, I don't think he knows a lot about the moon. Probably not. Nah, I'm not going to go. <laughs> I don't like space anyway. So I wouldn't go. But... I first hear what he says. And I accept that this is his belief. And belief is sacred. Every belief is a poem. Every belief is a prayer. So when someone says to me, well, you know, indigenous people are actually inferior, I know that's their belief, and I let them have it. You just go on with that. See where it gets you. Not far in my world. <laughs> But see where it takes you. And of course, it takes you to your own stupidity. If I think white men are stupid, I'm going to walk right into my own stupidity too. But here's what I know about all of us. We have this broad perception of the world. And we have a long memory of it. Not so much your folks. Because you'd have to read a whole lot of books to find out answers to things that come quite quickly for us. But your science fits very nicely in mine. So I'm going to tell you this little story about decolonizing your, your dialogue with yourself. Um, the crabs are walking on the shore. Dungeness crabs. Deep sea crabs. We know they're deep sea crabs. They are not supposed to be on that shore. Why are they there? So this guy phones me. He says, the crabs are walking on the shore. What's going on? I said, I don't know, but Florine's the oldest lady in this uh, community. Maybe I'll go ask her. Oh, most thing I know about crabs walking on the shore is when the, when the high look happened and the flood happened, then all the crabs were walking on the shore. I said, yeah, what, what was going on? Well, at the same time, all the volcanoes went off. Oh, so there was red tide. Yeah, red tide. It turned bright red. Well, I know red tide is toxins. A few white people told me that, <laughs> so I know that. I said, you better phone one of your white guy friends there, George, because it's toxicity. Is that what she said? No, she said red tide. But I translated it into European language, and it means toxicity. There's some poison in that water. He says, okay. So he calls his friend. Let's call him Mr. Foster, just for sake. You know, so he has a name. And he comes, takes this little vial, tiny little vial. Doesn't touch it, you know. He's careful with He's got little gloves and everything like that. Puts it in a little case, takes it down to Vancouver. Comes back, and he says, there's 65 times the level of cadmium in this water that is safe for anything's consumption. 
oh, okay, so we should go ask Chlorine what to do about it. And the white guy says, well, I think we should study the problem. Yeah, you, you get right on that, he says. I'm going to ask Florine. And Florine says, plant eelgrass. That's what the people did in the old days. So we go back and the white guy says, no, I really think we should study this before we plant the eelgrass. And the, and the guy says to him, his friend says, you study because that's what you do. We plant eelgrass like our Siam said, because that's what we do. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of uh, conversations with Hatsalano and the mayor saying to him, why did you give all, your mother all the money? She buried her money under the Granville Bridge. If anybody's interested, you could dig up the Granville Bridge, probably find it. But anyway, he says, because uh, that's what we do. Give the money to the old lady. You want to hear a little bit of uh, Celia's song, and then I'll open it up for questions. This is the book they said was uh, too foreign and too ethnic as well. So my new publisher, Mark uh, Cote, who's from my area and went to high school with my brother, said, I think it's standing on the verge of being not enough ethnicity and foreignness. And so he's mixed up. If you make it more ethnic, then it'll probably shoot out into the heavens and everybody will love it. And I said, well, I was thinking of having uh, Mink tell a story. Oh, that's a great idea. I was thinking the same thing and I was thinking to myself at the same time, you're such a liar, Lee. You do not want Mink to tell that story because you don't know anything about Minks. <laughs> but anyway, I rewrote it so that Mink told the story. So this is Mink. There's something helpless in being a witness. And I think you must know that from residential school, right? Because you all witnessed if you're older. But anyway, there's something helpless in being a witness. No one comes here anymore, just me. I can't seem to resist returning to the place where oh, well, everyone died. Some insane kind of illness overtook them, burned them with its heat. The monster illness disfigured them before taking their lives. It's so quiet. The longhouse is decrepit now. I stand transfixed. It looks as though a single shingle had blown off the roof during a storm, beginning the process of destruction, precipitating the damage inside. That single missing shingle allowed the rain to leak into the woven mats covering the bones on every bench of the house, attacking the blankets in the southwest corner. The fire in the center died long ago. The wet ashes make the inside seem so forlorn. A lonely feast bowl squats near where the fire had been. The damp has spread to all corners, and over the decades, storm rains invaded and reinvaded the longhouse, tearing more and more shingles in a steady rake. The wet penetrated. Summer heat spur spurred the blanket's decay. The bones lie naked beneath the rotted weavings. Under these, the dead rotted. Even after all this time, the smell of them commingles with the molding blankets and mats. The scent is horrific. Mold, flesh, and goat fiber rot fill the house. The bones of the dead loathe their own strength. They should not be here. I worry for the dead. Okay, I'll take questions now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Kassiam. Thank you. Someone called me scary or terribly, terrifyingly smart, which I think is what they call women who are smart, but anyway, terrifying. <laughs> My daughter's here, and I told her when I when I heard that, I said, "Oh, want to form the sca scary uh, scary pants tribe with me? <laughs> we'll invite all kinds of foreigners into our tribe <laughs> that are scary smart." Anyhow, anybody interested in asking a question? I do give long answers, so only one or two of you ask to ask. Go up to the mic, right up to the mic, young man. Oh, look at how tall he is. I'm a short people. You know, I'm second tallest in my family, and I have 22 siblings. 11 of them are men. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, 
will speak uh, with accent. Okay. Uh, but you will hopefully understand me. Sure. Uh, I would like to visit your 100th birthday, and I would like to invite to my 100th birthday, including all the people from the room. Okay, except you look really young. Doesn't Do you matter. think I'll live to be 170? <laughs> but uh, you mentioned that uh, you would like uh, to accept that challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to ask you, how would one immigrant show respect to native people, in your opinion? Okay, you have that word in your language, and we don't use it uh, where I come from because I was an immigrant at 12. I was a permanent Im immigrant in this country, and this is my land. So we don't like that word very much, and there's nothing like it in our language. You're a guest or you're a newcomer. If you're a guest, you're probably born here, and we've accepted you as a, as a guest. And we hope that you're a good guest and don't destroy the land that was so beautiful and so rich. So the first thing is love the land. The second law we have is take care of the water. The third one is honor the women. And the last one is connect with each other and all beings. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's why I hang on to John Ralston Saul. <laughs> I stay connected to that guy. I can't see you, so if you want to talk, just run to a mic and beat up anybody that gets on your way. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I have an accent too, so I'm a newcomer. <laughs> Uh, and my question is very similar to, so um, what is your vision of the right relation starting now? And um, what is your vision of the, the um, birth story of the country that is Canada here? Okay, it's very much easier for me to answer the earth story one because I don't know you, ma'am. I don't know what a right relation would be between us because you are 50% of the relation. I don't know what's right for you. But I do, I do know this, that I have an hour and a half every week that I don't have to do something for my family or my work or my writing or you know, some annoying interviewer or some student that is confused about something. So every hour, that hour and a half is very precious to me and I think very carefully what I do with it. And my big thing has been to clean up the English Wabagoon River system for 42 years. I've worked on that. And you know, they, they uh, gave them 85 million to clean up the river and then they withheld the check. That's the government of Canada for you, you know what I mean? But I got these little flowers on my chest. You see them? That's the Order of Canada. Woo, I'm an officer of the Order of Canada. So now when I make a phone call to uh, Kathleen Wynne, she phones me back. <laughs> and I say to her, you know, I do interviews with reporters probably twice a week. I'll probably do that for the rest of my life. So I'm telling you this. You release that check because if something happens to my friend Julie De Silva that I've known since she was born, I'm going to hold you personally responsible. And that other friend of yours in Ottawa, you know who she is, Carolyn, right? I'm going to hold her personally responsible too. So I'm phoning her next. And she gets back to me faster. So I'm just telling you that. And I hung up. They released the check. So this holds a little bit of authority. That's a right relation between me and the government. And I am concerned about that. The right relation between me and Julie De Silva is that we love each other and take care of each other. And hi, it's Sam, we hold each other up. I'll hold up John Ralston Saul. We have been places together. We have been places separately 
and have come together on those places. I don't know if he has a right relation with me, but he knows that. He knows that. So you need to connect with some indigenous person and establish what right relations are for you because you're half, half the relationship. Do not give in to some indigenous crazy person that tells you something you can't do. That's not the way to go. You're a woman and you're saddled with the responsibility of making sure the water in this land is clean. In my story, it doesn't say if you're white, you get away with it. It just says the women are responsible for keeping the water clean. The men are responsible for the land. I want you to know that. It doesn't say that if you're European, you get away with shit. <laughs> it doesn't say that at all. It, says we, it doesn't tell us indigenous people either that if some white guy tells us we can't do something, that we're relieved of responsibility. It doesn't tell us that at all. The story says we're responsible for the water, you and I. That's the English Wabagoon River system and Grassy Narrows. The men are responsible for the land. So that's the oil sands, gentlemen. That's the tar sands. <laughs> Someone's coming! You! <laughs> uh, Chimigwitch. Yeah, Chimigwitch. Hi, Chimigwitch. Uh, I'm Algonquin from this area, so welcome. Ah, but I won't tell you. you all the good berry picking is <laughs> until we get along. No, um, I've been here probably before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> it's over near I look O, young for in my the age. hills behind O. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you. I've been uh, reading your work for many, many years uh, since I was at Carleton, and we started the Aboriginal students group there uh, in the early 90s, yeah. like 89. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you, like the Unity Walk, the Nishu Walkers, all these youth that are doing a lot to sort of figure this relationship out. Where do you feel things are at right now? Um, and I say this, okay. you know, First because I'm all, working on a lot of this myself. The feeling is this, right? See, where do I feel things are at? <laughs> no, I think about things more than I feel them. So I know this is part of the language of modern day society, you know. Well, I feel like you're standing on my parade, you know. I don't <laughs> give a shit what you feel. Get out of my way. You know, it's an expression. We have to, yeah, yeah. We have to be that? careful with, with the language we use. Yeah. Someone said to me something about positivity, and I says, please, what, does that, what do you mean when you say that? Well, your heart is enlightened by your love. And I said, say that, please. That makes sense to me. But positivity? That's addy addy. Because positive is to add something, right? Addy addy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, what do I think that yeah. young people, where do I think young people are going? Well, first of all, the water walkers uh, were started by Josephine Mandamon, who's not anywhere near young. She's about 15 years older than I am. And I have walked with her, and she terrifies me. She expects so much. Um, but I was 45, and I tried to keep up with her when she was 70. And it was very, very difficult. So she set a hard road for us to follow. And uh, now it's up to me to keep setting that hard road for our young people to call, follow. And my auntie is uh, the Ta'a for my nation. I'm, the, I'm a CM. That means I'm somebody. But she's the Ta'a. That means she's everything. <laughs> she's all the somebodies together. She said to the men, warrior up, you guys, because you got to take care of the land. Every one of you. She was talking to 25,000, most of them white. Okay. So then we got in our little canoes, and she says, I'm going to get in my canoe, and I'm going to attack that ship. It was a big ship, one of those big... Uh, Oil carriers, huge. <laughs> I said, what are you going to attack them with, Auntie? Bow and arrow. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I said, I'm going to, it's going to be the greatest demonstration we ever did. And I said, why? Because it's going to be so freaking funny. <laughs> so we did. We were bouncing our little arrows across that thing, and hundreds of white people joined us, and we were just hilariously laughing. But at the same time, we had a serious point to make. That these people took us on 
with all their technology and couldn't defeat us. Now, here's another way to look at residential school. I know a lot of bad things happened there. My dad had to sleep with dead people and all that sort of stuff. But here's what he said, and I repeat it. They took us on before residential school, and they couldn't defeat us. So they thought, well, maybe if we take the kids on, we can defeat them. Did not happen. Our children will not be defeated any more than I was. I have a man friend that was 70 and he was speaking his language. And I said, how old were you when you went to residential school? He said, three. And I said, how the hell did you have it? hang on to the language? Funny thing, he says, I was too young to be with the grade ones. So they put me with the big girls so they could look after me. I was only three. And every time I fell down, I'd start to cry. And they would pick me up. One of them would whisper words in this ear, in English, and the other one would whisper words in this ear, in up the river, how come And that's how they brought the language home to him. And then they told him, don't tell anybody. You're a little warrior. Don't tell anybody you know this language. He did not. So the ones that got caught were the ones that told on themselves. Now, I do that myself. I tell on myself all the time. My little granddaughter does too. She tells on herself. So we have to be careful and differentiate between what is public that we say to each other out loud and what we have to be very quiet about. Yeah, we have to be quiet about some things. But we still have to take care of the land and we have to take care of the water. And our young people are standing up to that. When they had that young girl with a feather stop, the police in New Brunswick, I think it was New Brunswick. Anyway, they were fracking and she was against fracking, you fracking devils. But anyway, she held up that feather and she stood all those cops up. They didn't want to move on her. I don't know if they're scared of that feather, but it looked pretty cool. <laughs> Just this little feather. Well, my uh, nephew... He started a demonstration in Vancouver, and I just happened to go there because my daughter said, they're having a demonstration. Come on, come on, come on. So off we went. And there was only 500 of us there, all Native people. And I said, yeah, we're going to walk out, he says, in the middle of Granville and down to the, to the water. And I said, there's only 500 of us, you know. They send a few cops. We're going to be clobbered. And he says, no, by the time we get down to the bottom, there's going to be a bunch of briefcases beside us probably measuring in the tens of thousands of people. And I said, really? Okay, I'll believe you. I just have to listen, right? I just have to accept what he said. If he's wrong, we'll definitely know that by the time we get to the bottom. So off we go, we're marching, and sure enough, five o'clock is when everybody gets off work in Vancouver. They come out of their buildings with their briefcases and their high-heeled shoes and their little umbrellas, and they're joining us. No more fracking! No more f thousands of people. Oh. Canadians are becoming Canadians to me. Do you see? Take care of the land. Take care of the water. Take care of the women. And stay connected. That's all we asked of you. And of course, don't stop us from accessing our own stuff, for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there you go. Let's have one more, and then we can uh, sit and chat privately. Say, so I got one more question that I'm burning up to ask. Oh, what's your mother like? She's dead. <laughs> <laughs> she was funny, though. She was a matey. Tracy Lindbergh, anybody hear her? She mentioned Lac -la Bish. Does she mention Lac -la Bish in that story? Sure she does. That's my mother. That's my mother. So, I'm a little girl fighting with my brother, just duking it out like we're really going to town on each other. We're five and six. She comes along, punch, punch. 
with her big meat hooks. She had big hands because she was a crab pounder, right? pounding crabs all day. So, boom, boom, and we say, oh, what did you do that for, Mom? And she said, oh, you were having so much fun, I thought I'd join in. <laughs> That's a Métis sensibility. We need a little of that. Thank you very much. Decolonize that.